what I call skills ecosystem approach and how I aim to build on that, uh, build on that kind of uh, basis to broaden out the model to include living as an active element in addition to work and learning. Um, so as you see, the, the first part, this, this, this presentation is in three parts. The first part's on the skills ecosystem approach. The second will be looking at a number of conceptual steps to build a why what I think is a wider social ecosystem model. And the third part is more speculative and looking at a social ecosystem model in terms of transitions, particularly green transitions to a more sustainable world. Um, this, my work with, uh, with Professor Anne Hodgson, who, who's, who's also now retired, um, is, is rooted, this uh, part of my work is rooted in the work of David Feingold, who I worked with and cooperated with in the early 1990s. And, and what David did uh, during his time at RAND in, in California was to develop a high skills ecosystem model. Um, I think many of you will have, uh, will have, have read it. Um, and he contrasted this development of, um, of a high skill tech based system in Silicon Valley with the low skills equilibrium in the UK. When he, he'd written about the LSE with um, David Soskis in, in the late 1980s. And what David Fangold identified as, as the key elements of a high skill ecosystem, uh, and here they're listed um, catalysts. Um, uh, US military spending in the 1980s, which actually helped, uh, as it were, propel forward technological innovation in California. Nourishment in terms of the role of research intensive universities to produce talent pools, support of environment, physical infrastructure, for example, and the concept of independence cooperation between actors in the region. Now, these four elements are kind of ecological terms. They're rooted in natural economic, natural ecological theory. So in effect, David, what, while he was introducing a theoretical element, he was actually still using, and subsequently other people have used, uh, ecosystem as a metaphor. Um, I was very, we were very much indebted to this work and we certainly used it in terms of casting a light on the low productivity levels in, in the UK. However, by 2010, we began to look at Silicon Valley in a different way. David saw it as a basis of a high skills, a self-sustaining high skills ecosystem. By 2010, we were associating it with what, uh, uh, you know, uh, some have called surveillance capitalism, the Silicon Valley tech giants, um, a talent magnet, but which actually brings about social and economic displacement. And this brings, this brings me to the, 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 one of the core issues that I'm researching, and that is, and looking at London and the, the effect of fintech, the financial technical technological sector, the I, looking at the phenomenon of very uh, of entrepreneurial ecosystems, which actually, while very economically dynamic and produce and wealth producing, actually bring about social displacement. So. What, what, what we started to do in, 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 several years ago was to reflect on high skill ecosystems as an elite concept. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't neutral anymore. It, we'd, seen, we'd seen two or three decades of development and some of the positives and a lot of the negatives that are associated with that particular form of financial technological development. Now, while we were, while we were coming to this conclusion, Others were actually trying to develop Fangor's work, particularly John Buchanan. And you will see there is a, an extent, a fairly rich literature um, on skills ecosystems, focusing on the Australian ecosystem pilots. And, he, and here, you know, the concept of vet skills is placed in a much set of wi a, a set of, uh, wider settings uh, of the enterprise and its relationship with business settings, with policy frameworks, with modes of engaging la labor, the structure of jobs and work design, and the types of skill formation being seen. Now, what 
what I think skills ecosystem provides us with, and here we look at some of the strengths and weaknesses, it, it certainly moves beyond the orthodoxy of skill supply, that somehow what employers need is an appropriate supply of skill. And what skills ecosystems concept was doing, and, and it certainly echoes in the work of, of you at Keep and others, was to think of skills as skills development as part of a more holistic system. Uh, not only, as it were, linked to skill supply, but skill demand. And, and I think it's what skills ecosystems were looking at, was a series of factors that will result in the raising of the systematic demand for higher level skills and innovation and development within companies linked to VET systems. So it, we're very much indebted to the, it's certainly high, you know, skill, high skill ecosystems forms the basis of moving forward. But unlike Buchanan, we, our reflections on Silicon Valley and their spatial effects led to possibly a more, a sharper critique actually, of some of the limitations of HSEs. I mean, I've mentioned their, 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 social, their social ecological effects and we'll, I, I'll come to more of that in a minute. But we also have to look at what happened to the skills ecosystems pilots in Australia and their, their kind of destination was found in the 2017 article by John Buchanan and colleagues, in which he, you know, looks at how, in a sense, they, they, were, they didn't take off because those companies found ways of developing skills, what we call neo, what he called neoliberal skill settlements, uh, that did not involve the kind of commitments to the dialogue and partnership in the wider system that is required by skills ecosystems. Nor did, in fact, Buchanan and colleagues actually critique, sufficiently critique, the HSC settlement that David Feingold, in a sense, was talking about in his 1999 work. Therefore, my, one of my conclusions was that while skills ecosystems are an extremely valuable concept and will come to see them as located within much wider social ecosystem model. His work and the work since hasn't really conceptualized the conditions for its own extension. And therefore, what I'm proposing here is an indebtedness on the one hand to the skills ecosystem approach, but wanting to locate it and skills development within a much wider set of social factors. And this is where we come to the, uh, the concept of a social ecosystem model. And that's what I'm going to do now. So in, in, I just want to make it absolutely clear that in critiquing some of the limitations of skills ecosystems, I'm not wanting to deny their usefulness or their centrality, but rather to place them within a wider ecosystem still. So, what, what we've been talking about, and this, this originates, well, it's propelled forward by our work in East London, particularly in the London Borough of Barking and Dagenham. And here you have a, a borough that is go, a good distance from the city of London, about 10 miles. And what had happened in the previous two decades, two or three decades, is that the city of London had developed People were displaced, they had to move out. There was waves of gentrification. And embarking in Dagenham, we were sufficient from as a, the, cent, the mono center of what we'll call the urban supernova to think about how people could both work, live and learn in the same area, that they weren't gonna be displaced and therefore, as it were, dependent then on what we call the commute into the, as it were, the urban supernova. So, we were adding to the skills ecosystem concept, the concept of living. Therefore, it's working, living and learning. That becomes the nexus on which we start to think about a wider ecosystem dynamic. As, as we've seen, this is also based on a critique of the Silicon Valley model. And I'll go through that thought experiment in a, middle, in, in a minute. So the concept of, of learning 
within a social ecosystem becomes related to good work. That's the, that's the skills ecosystem part and sustainable living. I mean, if you don't have sustainable living, then it's very difficult to actually for, for local authorities and regional authorities to develop inclusive economic and social growth. And inclusive economic and social growth and sustainable growth is the central problematic of a social ecosystem model, whereas vet skills was a central problematic of a skills ecosystem model. I'm, I'm suggesting that the skills ecosystem is nested inside this wider, this, this triple nexus. Now, as we were reflecting on what had happened to Silicon Valley, um, our work really went through a thought experiment. I mean, one or two critics have called it wishful thinking, but I mean, what in, re in researching the theories behind, or some of the conceptions behind um, Silicon Valley, we came across uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem models coming out of business schools in particular. Interestingly, they, they talk about Silicon Valley, they talk about FinTech districts in London and in other uh, metropolitan global centers, although they don't cite Fangor's work, which is interesting in itself. But what, the critique of Silicon Valley and it's what we call elite ecosystem, entrepreneurial ecosystem approach, it gave rise to a set of opposites. This is the thought experiment. So here we have eight dimensions. We have mission and function, moving from private to public. The horizontal terrain, this is very important for us. Interestingly, Elite entrepreneurial ecosystems do exploit places, they, you know, either places to work or places to live, so that they become attractive to the talents pool. Whereas when we were working in Barking and Dagenham, we wanted to reshape the place because it was, it was not attractive in that traditional sense. It had to build its, in a sense, its, habit, its habitable, sustainable living capacity. The way that, that people thought about uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems were in a sense retrospective. They looked at what had happened and tried to provide explanations. Whereas our argument was that social ecosystems didn't exist yet. Elements of them existed. And therefore what we were engaged with wasn't just retrospective understanding, but prospective theorizing. And here we come to the issue of whether in fact ecosystem thinking was largely metaphorical or actually had some theoretical elements. And I'll come back to that point later. Uh, critical were the type of institutions um, and organizations involved in either these elite entrepreneurial ecosystems or the inclusive social ecosystem model. Uh, clearly we're seeking a movement from simply privatized civil society networks to a more public private mix. And also the economy tends to, to differ. It, Clearly the economy uh, is niche, it's FinTech, high skill levels, whereas social ecosystems, and by the way, skills ecosystem model under Buchanan recognize this is far more diverse, traditional, digital, and foundational. Also important for us was the type of educational participation, um, entrepreneurial ecosystems overwhelmingly research intensive university focused, looking for the talent pool, whereas the social ecosystems, because they're catering for a much more diverse range of skills, including a foundational economy, are more likely to see partnerships, not only with the universities, but further education colleges, independent learning providers, uh, and critically, local authorities and regional authorities. And here, we, we, again, we were looking at other dimensions, the workforce and community participation. Within skills ecosystems, and certainly within the entrepreneurial ecosystem model, there is greater em employee participation in flatter companies. Um, this idea of a teal type of participatory organization is one of the most advanced expressions of this. Whereas we were looking also at community work and democratic participation. And finally, there was a different concept of time involved. Entrepreneurial ecosystem models had understandably time-bound cycles of 
a decay and regeneration. In fact, it the, the idea of an entrepreneurial ecosystem would arise out of the decay of the existing formation through spin-off companies and what have you in order to produce the next, as it were, cycle of growth. Whereas in terms of social ecosystems, we were much more interested in long-term project for social ecosystem building and construction, rather than in fact, the, uh, as it were, generation decay regeneration cycle. So this, this was a, it's a thought experiment because what we were do, developing was a, was a set of concept of opposites. But we didn't stop with that. We had to start thinking theoretically about how these more inclusive social dynamics could be built, oft, usually often in areas which were economically and socially underdeveloped. So we did this in two ways, uh, uh, Professor Hodgson and myself. First of all, um, we added to fine goals four elements, and we'll come back to those four elements, the catalysts, interdependence, um, support of environment, and so on. We added to that a spatial interpretation of the work of Yuri Bromfenbrenner. Now, Bromfenbrenner's work um, has been used extensively in social psychology, in health work, etc. But we, we were very interested in the spatial aspect of skill development because further education colleges in England have a large footprint. They're both local, they're also sub-regional and can be regional specialist institutions. And so we, what we did with Brumpenbrenner's uh, scalers was to give them a much more spatial feeling, much more spatial character. And here we have them, Brumpenbrenner had four, we've now we, we had five, we now have six. The microsystem, which actually looks very much like his, his microsystem, of personal relationships. The meso system, we actually attribute to an institutional setting. I'll come back to that because it's important. Then the exosystem, this is where the biggest changes take place. We develop the exosystem into levels, level one and level two. Exosystem one is the local context in which the school, college or bet provision operates. Exosystem two is the regional economy dimension. So Exosystem 2 is a far much larger scale, but it is still mediating between macro and micro and meso. We have the macro system, which we associate with national policy and socioeconomic and cultural contexts. And then like Bromford Brenner's later work in 1994, we have a chrono system. And that is the, the transition and patterning of events over time, over the life course. So, Providing the spatial element, I think, was very, very important because it allowed us to think about living once again, not just working. And if we want to think about, again, a contrast and comparison between skills ecosystem approaches and the social ecosystem, as it were, connecting working, living and learning, you could see the skills ecosystem approach as lodged mainly at the mesosystem level, that of the it, the enterprise and its wider relationships, whereby the social ecosystem model linked to living and the spatial concept is lodged much more at exosystem one and two. So it's, the, it's, it's, this, it's, it's this kind of middling to what we call the middling terrains between national and local that the social ecosystem model is very concerned about and concerned about the type of governance that takes place in order to stimulate inclusive local, regional, economic, social, and educational growth. And then we finally go back to find goals four dimensions and then start to develop these through a 45 degree analysis. And I'll come back to that in the third part of this presentation. So these were the important conceptual steps building on Feingold, introducing a spatial concept of Bromfenbrenner right, in order to arrive at um, a, a social ecosystem model. So let's just have a look at the, the kind of how this nexus uh, emerges. So we, we have the research in the London context and we're particularly interested in how to overcome 
the development of urban supernova. So the social ecosystem model is not located at the level of the enterprise. We, we leave that in effect to the skills ecosystem model. The social ecosystem model is at a, a, a higher on a, on a higher scale and is interested in, in a sense, how people live and move in relation to work. And obviously very critical of what we call supernova developments, where everybody just piles into the center, having the inevitable long commute. And as families on low incomes are pushed further and further away from the center. So obviously our critique of the Silicon Valley uh, entrepre elite entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem model looks at some of the urban outcomes in terms of economic, political and social exclusion. And this, we therefore arrive at a vision for London, but this could be other cities of a more polycentric city. And I'll cut, we'll, we'll see a few, uh, as it were, diagrams of this a bit later on, in which there is still a monocenter, but there's much less emphasis on it, in that it becomes surrounded by a series of polycenters in which people can work, live and learn without having to have excessive travel. Now, that doesn't mean you're abolishing travel. There will, there will always be travel to a monocenter. The question is whether cities become imbalanced and literally, like a supernova, almost as it were, collapse in on themselves because of the pressure on transport systems, uh, on pollution, on, on rising ground rents, um, on all the other displacement effects that we've seen as a result of elite entrepreneurial uh, dynamism. And the challenge here was to get a whole range of social actors and stakeholders involved in the co-creation process. Again, that these, are, are, these are evocations from the skills ecosystem approach. But critically, we became interested in the identification of civic anchor institutions. These do not only include universities, but particular types of workplaces that are prominent in providing labor, local authorities, third sector, civil society organizations working in some kind of strategic alliance. Before I go on to a definition, here's, here's a diagram um, of, of the supernova and, poly, and polycentric approaches. Again, just to emphasize that the social ecosystem model in, in our work thus far has been predominantly interested in the shape and reshaping of cities and therefore the destination of work and skills in, in the light of that. You can see in A, the classical monocentric model, then you have the, a polycentric or dispersed model, a composite model, and then an urban village model. And I mean, I, I think that if you are thinking about our concept of social ecosystem, it probably is a, a a blend of hybrid of C and D. But what you have is this greater emphasis on sustainable hubs, social hubs in cities, and we'll have to discuss where, uh, whether it's applicable to rural areas too, sustainable hubs where people can work, live and learn. And not to simply follow the market. It involves obviously a, a regulatory effort uh, on behalf of political state and civil society. So here we come to the definition, and it, it has some, you can see some of the linguistic similarities to the skills ecosystem approach. It's conceived as an evolving place-based, this is the important social formation. Um, and what I want to do now is to think about how we further develop this, this, this concept. And this is where uh, the definitions have started to change a bit. And we're looking here at a social ecosystem that has what we call collaborative horizontalities, facil facilitating verticalities. We'll come to talk about the role of the state now, 45 degree mediation and ecological time. So this model, which up until about uh, two years ago was largely spatial and locally based, what I've done since, as a result of my work with Compass uh, and Neil Lawson and other, uh, other uh, political intellectuals in, in, in the UK, has been thinking about how, in fact, you build social, uh, social ecosystem model. Be, 
on the one hand, it's obviously rooted in the locality, in localism and local authorities. But what's quite clear is you can't depend on the local to develop whole systems. You have to have a facilitating state um, and you have to have friendly support of regulatory systems. Now, this is taking Feingold's work further than he took it. But I, I am um, what I'm going to turn to next. In fact, I'm going to go back to Feingold's four elements and to introduce this idea of 45 degree dynamics to develop these uh, particular features. But before I do that, I, I know this, I know there are lots of different concepts here and I, 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 I'm guilty possibly of overcooking this presentation, but I, I do want to just talk for a minute about evolving ecosystem thinking. Because if I was asked, why, are, why am I bothered about this form of thinking? because I think it's, it's, it's time has come and time is overdue. I mean, we're, we're, we're living in the age of the epoch of the Anthropocene on our indelible effects on the planet, uh, global heating, uh, resource depletion. Uh, these are the, this is the most fundamental existential threat that we face. And therefore uh, ecosystem thinking, in fact, has to find a place in order to steer us to a, a, a better world. And some of the work that I did previously got me thinking about that ecosystem thinking itself could be seen to be going through various stages of development. And so I, 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 I introduced this idea of a four-staged embedded model. At the center of it is the observation of the natural world. And this is where most ecosystem work over the last hundred years has actually been rooted and is still rooted. But then we get into, then then we have an interesting development whereby we have where you have the development of what we call metaphors for uh, comp to reflect complex human activity derived from the natural world, and a lot of the work thus far, I, I would argue, most of the work that take that's taken place in terms of human ecological thinking is still metaphorically based. I was anxious to leave metaphors behind and to try to develop theories of uh, holistic human economic technological development, in a sense, using an ecological paradigm. And I, I think that the concept of the social ecosystem is an attempt to move in that direction. Interestingly, John Buchanan, did refer in his 2017 article to metaphorical approaches. I don't think I don't think the skills ecosystem approach has broken with metaphor. But I, I'm arguing that you have to break with metaphor. You have to develop a distinct set of uh, human ecological theories. And that's where the extension of Brompenbrenner, the extension of Feingold, and now 45 degree mediation comes in. And I'm suggesting that actually and there may be lots of reflections of this, by the way, that we have to think of ecological systems as whole political systems, political economy systems. And that in fact, ecological, human ecological thinking is a form of green transitional thinking. Right? And this is where my interest in fusing modern Gramscian Marxism with ecological theory is really driven by four in which I try to develop concepts more immediately applicable to the world in which we live. Back to Feingold. If you remember his four, his four elements. Now, I've been thinking about this and I thought, well, Feingold had a sense of the region, not yet a great sense of the local, and the dynamics between them. He, certainly the concept of independence is there. So in terms of catalysts, What's interesting here in terms of, say, spending isn't simply strategic investment by the political state. That's a very, very important. But you also have to have local investment and local participation in local budgeting as well. I mean, we could see some radical experiments in Brazil, Barcelona, elsewhere. This idea that catalysts don't just come from the, the nation state yeah, or, or even from uh, uh, continental regions like the EU. The catalysts have to be developed locally 
through the participation of people in terms of their role in shaping economically uh, their own localities. The, the nourishment, what's interesting here, the concept of nourishment, I go back to this idea of the, the, the elite entrepreneurial ecosystem and, and talent pool and dependence on research intensive universities. Here, we, we talk about the nourishment coming through a much more diverse range of education institutions in, in, in the UK and Australia elsewhere. You, these would be either further education or TAFE colleges, as, as well as work-based learning providers. So this is more applied local knowledge linked to skill development within foundational economies, middle and uh, mid-skill mid economies and high-skill economies. Um, then the supportive environment, again, National regulatory frameworks can be very, very important. Um, this would certainly provide the, the framework in which companies would, th th there would be some level of compulsion really in, in, in these regulatory systems to uh, around wage, uh, wage offers uh, uh, as, as well as health and safety uh, um, and, and maybe other regulatory and so certainly the sustainability programs. But at the same time that we need the idea of social ecosystems was to develop local and regional infrastructures. And what's interesting about East End is moving the film studios to Barking and Dagenham. Some of the London markets are moving out there. There's the real possibility of having this more polycentric, economically polycentric London than everything just being, as it were, in an overheated uh, monocenter. And then this idea of interdependence is joined up national governance linked to local collaborative networks. I want to finish now by arguing, and this is a very speculative point, but it is an, an issue that interests me deeply. What kind of thinking do we need in order to develop these holistic systems of change? Now, Within the Marxist tradition, there has been talk of the concept of the general intellect, which has been deeply uh, connected to technological developments. I, I want to move away from that. Uh, coming from a Gramscian tradition, um, I, I, I've been thinking about what I call the organic intellect. And to put, to put it simply, to keep us within time, the organic intellect is in fact the fusion, the fusion of general social shared thinking, theories of the world. I mean, these are conceptions of the world or of change, but they're ones that are shared amongst the people and forms of specialism, connective specialism. The fact of the matter is you cannot have sustainable change without specialists, but the question is whether the specialists are in fact a, a distinct detached class, a traditional intellectual, or whether they're rooted in the social changes and in the, the shared thinking of the mass of the people. And therefore this idea of the organic intellect, now we gradually talked about organic intellectuals, I'm talking here about the organic intellect. The organic intellect is this fusion of connective specialist thinking and the general intellect defined as advanced shared social knowledge. Now, what that means is, is that we have to have people on the ground working in local government, activists, who also can draw on the specialists and themselves become more specialised. But having the specialists who do not detach themselves into a university, but think of themselves as part of a, a wider social alliance in which the, the propulsion of knowledge, 40, what I call 45 degree, combinational knowledge is the result of the fusion of new forms of scientific discovery with new forms of social and ecological discovery. So what I'm suggesting here is that the social ecosystem model is it going, will have to be based on new concepts, more integral, uh, dialogistic concepts of knowledge that involve shifts in specialization as well as shifts in uh, work, general thinking. And as an aside and, and, and as a, a departing point, um, you will know of the work of Michael Young. He's a close colleague of mine. And we had a debate in Beijing, the Capital Normal University, around the development of what I call 45 degree knowledge. And I actually would associate 45 degree knowledge with what Michael calls 
Futures 3. And I will leave it on that note because I know of his connections, deep connections with South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ken. That was uh, really, really helpful. For, for, for those who don't know me, I'm Stephanie Alles, um, and I'm going to be, I'm also based at the Real Center, um, and I'm going to be chairing the, the discussion. It's really great to have you, um, have you with us here today, Ken, and I think you've really given us an enormous amount of, of, of a, a range of different things to think about. Um, and I liked your, your last point, and it is true that Michael has a long association with us, and we have, in fact, some of us at the Real Center have literally uh, joined the seminar from our reading group, which is looking at knowledge and work. Um, so I think that your last, uh, your last slide and your last set of points really raise very, very interesting provocations from that perspective. I also think, and, and thanks Ruan from the Real Center for posting in the, in the chat, um, the point about um, district development model. Your, your, your points about cities are really fascinating, Ken, in relation to South Africa's spatial geography, where we have um, a kind of a nightmare horror of your, um, of your hub um, cities, where um, the, 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 the first one, um, where, you know, as part of apartheid, people were located in huge distances from the places in cities where they were allowed to live. Where they were allowed to live was a huge distance from where they were allowed to work. So it really, I think South Africa <laughs> offers some really particular challenges for, for thinking about these ideas. And, and, and hopefully these ideas offer some really interesting ways in which South Africa could start dealing with that, the the spatial legacy of apartheid, which is one of the many legacies of apartheid that has remained absolutely intractable. So I think I just want to thank you so much, Ken, for the presentation. And we are now going to move to questions and discussions and comments. Um, Ruan and Taylor have already got going with a, a debate in the chat se session. I would like to open up for um, Anyone to raise a question, there's the Q&A function, um, but it's probably just easier to, to raise questions in the, um, in the chat. Um, but also, um, colleagues, please do feel free to raise your hand, um, because we would love to have people actually speaking and asking their questions to Ken. We've got one question in the chat from um, Joanna, um, so asking, is your thinking in the 45 degree element different to the idea of collaborative horizontalities. Well, um, it, while you're thinking about that, I just want to invite other colleagues to please um, add your questions in the chat or raise your hand with any questions that you have to Ken or any comments that you would like to make, um, issues that you would like to raise, points that you would like to uh, take issue with Ken. We do have uh, John Buchanan in our seminar lineup. Oh, so, <laughs> unfortunately, we couldn't get him in the seminar today because the time difference issues right. are just too awful with Australia. So, um, when we do have his seminar, we're going to be doing it at a different time to our regular seminar slot. But I think that we will certainly pass on, and I think it, it does make for a really great engagement with a, a set of related issues. So yeah. over to you, Ken, while anyone else um, is uh, thinking of their questions. Now, look around, Ruse, I'm ducking and diving out of screen. I'm looking for a pen and pencil. But in, in the meanwhile, um, 45 degree politics certainly includes collaborative horizontalities. In fact, the collaborative horizontalities are, uh, as it were, on, on the horizontal dimension fundamental, but it involves also the intersection between collaborative horizontalities and facilitating verticalities. That is to say that, and this, I've seen this time and again in political struggles, you, you, you know, you have local campaigns that peter out. And the question then is, how do, is it possible in democratic political life to, as it were, use a, a, a democratic state, the more vertical state, to democratize it, but at the same time to help facilitate local development. And I'm absolutely convinced that the real, the sustainable development lies at the intersections 
of collaborative horizontalities and facilitating verticalities. And that means that the whole of state and civil society are sites of struggle. If you don't get people elected, you can't get facilitating verticalities. Right? So, I mean, so, but at the same time, the, the pressure for change and the ideas, I am absolutely convinced, come from the horizontal and not just from the vertical. And this is where Michael and I start to really square up to each other. Yeah, right. I mean, in terms of some of the issues around knowledge, right? So, yeah, it's, intersec it's the intersections, I think, between the horizontal and vertical that I find the most interesting. Uh, I've lost you, uh, Stephanie. Sorry, sorry no, about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I put myself on mute because I had a little bit of light homeschooling going on in the background. <laughs> it's challenging working <laughs> where you live. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Ken, are you okay if I um, throw a couple of questions at you at I'm the same good. time? I oh, know, I, I, I'm good, I'm good. Okay, so I've got a question from um, Judy Harris. She's asking, are there any historical examples of what you are conceptualizing? So you mentioned Brazil and Barcelona. Have you thought about mapping and analyzing these developments against your model? Um, and another one from Sam Ajaydu. Sorry, Sam, if I, if I um, mispronounced your name. One of the key things in the presentation is focused on social ecosystem development, which set which, which highly centers on sustainable development. Individuals could look at how to develop organic intellect. Okay, wait, sorry. I think I actually need to go back. There's, there's a discussion in the chat about organic intellect. So I'm gonna go back in the chat and pick up the whole discussion um, and then relay it to you while okay. you're answering Judy. Well, first of all, um, well, the answer is that we haven't done this so far, but it's a very interesting idea. I mean, if I go back to John Buchanan's work with colleagues in 2017, he did a mapping, you know, it, it, in, in the light of the, the fading of this Australian skills ecosystem pilots, he did a mapping of the four features of Fine Gold's elements against different national terrains and, and came to the conclusion that they all exist in different places, but not in one place. So that, 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 that mapping's possible. Um, I, I think because the concept of social ecosystem model is emergent, that is to say, you, you, you may find elements of it, you may find certain forces and directions, um, but it would be interesting to do it. The question would be, what would, what would be the reason for doing it? Is it to help? Is it, it, I mean, I do see that kind of, that's kind of theorizing is providing some kind of compass for people to undertake holistic, participative, sustainable development. But yes, it's, a, it's certainly an interesting research question because people say, well, they don't exist yet. Well, I, I think the arguments will be, and it's probably in, not entirely dissimilar to John Buchanan's, is some elements of them do exist. Now I've seen them exist. They exist in, in, in localities inside the UK. But it's interesting to think of them as social ecosystems and not, you, you, think, you could think of them in other terms as well. Thanks, Ken. I'm going to now relay to you a brief discussion that happened in the chat on, um, organic intellect. Um, so Ruan uh, from the Real Center asked, would it not be difficult for the organic intellect to manifest in one person? What are the potential barriers to developing connective specialist knowledge? Then Hela re res um, responded, why should it be in one person? Ruan said, it doesn't have to be in one person, but it could be that people struggle to communicate and collaborate for a range of reasons. This is a very South African Issue, I think, Ruan, social, economic, political, disciplinary, etc. Um, and then we had a, uh, the last comment on this issue, which is um, 
that uh, in uh, in, the, um, in social ecosystems development centered on sustainable development, individuals could look at how to develop such organic intellect in order to have an effective and collaborative social development. So that's just a couple of ideas. And sorry, and here's one more. Um, how do you actively and consciously incorporate the marginalized and voiceless? I'm thinking here of San Francisco, where Black, Latino, Japanese, and LGBTQI communities are being pushed out by elite and technical IT workers and executives. So those are a couple of issues in relation to your organic intellect point. And then I've got a few other points, but I'll, I'll let you just um, come back on that one first. Um, I'm, I'm in trying to answer that. Uh, let's just go to this particular slide. On the one hand, it is possible for the organic intellect to be developed in an individual. For example, and this would be a classical one, you could have a clinician, a doc, you know, a, doc, a highly skilled and qualified clinician who in fact understands the social roots of medicine, decides to work in particular uh, communities uh, and adopts a, a wider social socialist ecological outlook that person would have the uh, but that person would may actually develop their their medical connector specialization linked to their wider philosophical outlook but as people as you say that so that's a possibility it's a possibility on a, a whole number a, a, a whole number of fronts but if you actually look at this diagram here what and, and I have written about this elsewhere, and I'm interested in, in collaborating with others to think about it, is that the intersection between vertical and horizontal knowledge takes, you can conceive of it in the 45 degree arc of multiple combinations. It's not just one combination. It's not for, there's not one 45 degree line, that's a metaphor. So you could have people, and this comes back to the point about, about marginalized communities. Marginalized communities will participate through political struggle through their self-organization, work, working with others. But then through that struggle, they have to develop specialist knowledge. If you think about a, a very different example, Greta Thunberg, Greta Thunberg start, you know, starts out as a, as a young person, incredibly concerned about the world and prepared to take an individual heroic stance, but increasingly becomes specialist. You know, she, you know, she not only invokes the scientists, she probably has read back to front yeah, what in fact they and had conversations with them about their their, their views about uh, global heating. So the point here is is to see the, the development of the organic intellect not in one place. It's these multiple intersections of what I you know of dominant subordinate relationships. There are lots of other concepts, Stuart Hall's concepts of double shuffle. I could introduce into all of this. Don't want to do that here because it's a different another story. But the idea is that. Everybody is capable of systematic social shared thinking, and everybody's capable of becoming more specialist. In that sense, it, 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 it adheres to uh, uh, Gramsci's dictum yeah, about the potential to develop organic intellectuals in the masses. But what the, the point I'm stressing here is not is, is move away from the Marxist, one of the Marxist concepts of the general intellect purely as general thinking and to develop the concept of organic intellect, which involves different degrees of specialist thinking. Because if we are going to alter the world and particularly in a, in a world of AI and machine learning, we're going to have to develop our own specialists who are on the side of, 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 of the people and not just on the side of tech companies, right? So there's a, but I agree, there's a massive set of issues in how to develop the organic intellect. And, but, and I also would take the point is that, uh, and it, it, is a typical, it is a traditional Gramscian one, that the organic intellect would not simply be in the minds of one person or even the concept of the extended mind. It would also be a collective intellect. Thanks, Ken. I think it raises really fascinating questions about the, what are the conditions of possibility for developing expertise? Um, but I've got a couple of other questions. One is, what are the historical reasons for the development of a monocentric model? Is there a degree of path dependency? 
Um, and another question is, does the transition towns model offer a good start? Um, yeah, I, I mean, there has to be some path dependency, um, uh, simply because of, of, of the legacy of infrastructure and of existing work patterns. What's going to be quite interesting is to see how far the supernova is going to be affected by COVID, post-COVID. You know, people working from home more. Will, will, will we simply reverse the mass commute? They may, um, um, I don't think there will be, a, whether it's a seismic shift or a smaller shift, I think there'll be some shift. So yeah, there is some path dependency there, but and that, that then means that you've got to think about the desirability of the more polycentric model. And there's some evidence, by the way, of architects uh, and certainly our people at UCL at the Bartlett thinking in these more polycentric terms because it just makes a lot more sense in terms of people's you know ecological footprint right and I, I, you know in the sense you know we, we are more connected but we actually become more local and linked then this issue of kind of social identity I mean I haven't explored that sufficiently but there's certainly the identity issue and how people see themselves and see their lives it will be very important transition towns haven't looked at it closely but i feel instinctively yes a useful a useful concept um, um i think there's a different set of literatures there but yes well, I, i'm interested in trying to link this work with all of these other bits i mean because the the, the work that i'm trying to develop is essentially connected but it is to develop a kind of a paradigm of thinking and activity, um, which links, as I start at the beginning, uh, working, living and learning. We haven't discussed the learning part too much because of possibly my, I don't think I'm sidetracked by the concept of the organic intellect. I think we should develop that. But the learn, we could be thinking about learning throughout the life course in new ways um, and learning in situated learning in workplaces. As, as a result of this model, linked to, of course, uh, the legacies or the originating inspirations of the skills ecosystem approach. Thank you. We, we're, we're going to come back to the organic intellect. I think it sparked a lot of interest. Um, and uh, I think it does. You know, it, it, because it, it foregrounds what I was raising, what are the conditions of possibility to develop expertise? Um, but before that, um, I, oh no, wait, this is also um, an organic intellect question. I've got two organic intellect questions. One is from Luke, and I'm also going to butcher his surname. I'm really sorry, Luke, Met, 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 Metelekamp, who asks, what do you see as the role of technology in um, supplying the kind of collective thinking for developing the organic intellect. And Cipello um, Mwangu, um, I am, Cipello, I gave you speaking rights because I actually wasn't sure exactly what your question was. Cipello asks, doesn't Gramsci talk about the organic capacity of the working class as part of the era of factory occupations in Italy um, in, the, in the 1920s? But Cipello, I wanted you to just, um, briefly explain um, you just elaborate quickly on what your what your um, question is in that regard or what what, what, what are you um, putting on the table in relation to that point do you want to you have to unmute yourself um, but I did uh, allow you to unmute yourself no oh, okay um, hi Steve uh, it was just a very I'm just building on the discussion going on um, with Ruan and everybody uh, about, well, it came to me, I see this idea that is the organic intellectual development on the individual or as Hila asks, is it like on a collective, on a community? And then it got me thinking that actually Gramsci, when he developed this notion of organic intellectual, he was also talking about a broader issue, what, what he called the organic capacity of the working class. And this is in relation to the occupation, the occupation of factory, the factory occupations in, in the 1920s. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if Ken goes into this when, when he theorizes the organic intellectual in, intellect in relation to his model. 
but but that that kind of building the organic capacity of the working class is where it comes out of is, is how it comes out of Gramsci. So, so that was what I was trying to relate. Well, I well first I'll, I, I'll address that one and then I'll go back to the question about AI and technology. Um, yeah, the, my concept of the organic intellect is un, is absolutely rooted in the mainstream Gramscian tradition, um, because while you can think about individuals um, and you can think about expertise, um, I, I did talk about the, as it were, the organic intellect as a shared collective intellect. Now, that, now thus far, the idea of the shared collective intellect is associated with what Marx referred to as a general intellect. But I wanted to introduce into the concept the gender and intellect as a shared, as a shared political social capacity, the issue of expertise and of specialization. Because, it, because in a world in which you have increasing diversifications and hybridizations of specialization and, and the role that it plays in a scientific, social, technological development, it's inconceivable to think of, as it were, the working class guiding its own future without the massive development of its, org of its organic intellect, not just, its, not just its political consciousness, but its, its technological, social uh, ex, you know, capacity. So I, I, do, I, I, I just think I'm rendering Gramsci's general thoughts about uh, developing a, a, a progressive hegemony in terms which may be more fitting on, on the 21st century. Remember, it is 100 years or more yes, since you wrote these things. On the question of technology and AI, now I've written a paper on this, and it's an informal paper which, is a, which I will make available. Uh, on, I, it's, in, in, it's in collaboration with David Guile, in which uh, I talk about the development of the organic intellect as a form of socialized uh, technological knowledge and why in fact you need a social dimension a so what we call the social shaping futures and this is an argument against technological determinism um, uh, 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 so that I will make that paper available I'll, I'll yeah I'll well it's actually on my website but I, I'm, given that I also exist in the 20th century, I'll email it to pressure, right? And, or you can make it available on your website. So yes, I, I, there's an entirely, there's a new type of debate to be had about the relationship between the organic intellect and the reshaping and socialization of AI and ML. Hmm. I mean, you can't put oh. it this way, you can't, if, if you want, if you want to have a technological future that we control, you have to have a vision of what you want. What you can't have is, is, is to simply give into technologies and just say, well, they have a mind of their own, and that's it, right? I mean, I've argued very strongly that um, the, the kind of AI we have at the moment is what we call narrow AI. It's not general AI. It, it, it's not. It, it doesn't have that capacity. It's not sentient. In that sense, we have some time, as um, although that short that time is shortening, as it is with global heating, we have time in which to exercise controls over both our climatic conditions and our technological conditions. And I'd like to think that social ecosystem thinking would help us in terms of those upcoming struggles. Okay, um, so. I've got another, um, I've got two questions for you from the chat and then I've, um, uh, I've suggested Sylvia Hammond if you could ask your question yourself because I'm not sure if I've completely understood it correctly. So if you can, after I ask um, the two questions from the chat, could you just uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question um, and then, and then can, you can answer all three. So the first question is, what is the starting point of creating an inclusive social ecosystem? Shouldn't it be started by an entrepreneurial ecosystem? Maybe a 45 degree approach, but it seems combining two different paradigms would not work together. And the second question is, 
are we talking about social technical imaginaries? Derek, I don't know if maybe I should also um, give you uh, speaking, ma make you able to speak so that you can explain that because I don't know, if maybe perhaps you want to explain it a little bit more than what there is in the chat. No, Derek doesn't want to. Um, so can I hand over to Sylvia to ask your question, please, Sylvia. Um, thank you, Stephanie. I think I've successfully um, unmuted myself. Um, yes, um, thank you. I was working from the basis of what are our problems, and we have unemployment, poverty, and inequality. So I was thinking about the ecosystem in this light, that we could, in fact, work to resolving those issues. We have an abundance of space, albeit contentious land issues, but we have an abundance of space. Is it possible, or would you think it's possible, to create from the ground up, consciously, deliberately working towards resolving unemployment via the building of the infrastructure, but also the building of a new society, an entire education system with that infrastructure, which works towards creating a new society. That was my thought. Thanks, Stephanie. Sylvia, do you, do you mean like as in like the new model cities that are being built in China and that our um, dear president told us we're going to have one of? Are you talking about that kind of thing? Uh, Stephanie, yes, that was. I, I thought about it. Uh, uh, Brazil has done it. I think if I am correct, Israel in the creating of Kibbutzin did a similar thing. Yes, start from the ground up and decide what you want philosophically, what is the society you wish to have, and quite literally build it from the ground up with the supportive educational system. Well, um, I have, we haven't thought about um, thus far about buildings from scratch because we, we, we worked within uh, historic cities, yes, and uh, along established urban areas. Um, but it's, I think the point, and there have been experiments that, I mean, you have to go back to New Lanarkshire and, you know, some of the developments in the 19th century where, um, you know, you, there were utopian socialists who thought about it as we're building these type of environments. It's possible to do so. I think my argument would be if that was the aim that you'd have to have a theory, a philosophy and theory of what you're trying to do. Um, and there's obviously a lot of work out there. I mean, remember, we had garden cities. Uh, interesting, Barking and Dagenham was a, you know, originally a garden city. So there have been these concepts in, in, in the past, and they, they, I think they're worth revisiting, but obviously with a new agenda, uh, a new agenda, a 21st century agenda that would introduce technology. So for instance, plat there's been the concept of platform cities. So there's, there's an interesting debate around that. Um, so yes, it's possible, um, but I think the point about the social ecosystem model to guide such a thing would be the connection of working, living and learning, that you would try to relate those in given, in, in given spatial scalars, right? And, and so, yes, it's possible to do that. Though I, I want to link back to that, to that particular answer, an answer to the question about entrepreneurial ecosystems. I have thus far contrasted them, but in reality, and when I think about the types of developments that are taking that could take place inside social ecosystems, you could have entrepreneurial ecosystems embedded inside social ecosystems. That is to say, you could have startups, the kind of collaborations that you have between them and larger companies, but they would be within a regulatory social framework that would prevent supernova developments, that actually would steer these kind of th this kind of dynamism would have to be shaped by both regulatory and by democratic participative mechanisms. And that's why it's really important to understand how we take the very best of the HSEs that Feingold, David Feingold talked about in 1999, but place them within these 
wider uh, social, as it were, considerations driven by forms of the organic intellect, where people in fact are both, you know, more highly conscious, certainly ecologically conscious and committed at the same time, increasingly expert technologically and in other ways in order to produce sustainable development. It's a huge educational task. Uh, linking education to infrastructure is really interesting. We would like to see much more of that because we have colleges in England that respond to things. But if you're going to develop skills in an area, you have to have predictability. That's why we wanted to see if studios were film studios were coming to East London, if markets were coming to East London, if there were a whole series of startups happening in kind of hubs. We would like the we would like to see the educational development modeled around these developments over five, 10 years and more. So you do need for, for these kind of things to happen. Social ecosystems are long historical projects. That's why I picked out that particular distinction with entrepreneurial ecosystems and their, their growth decay cycles. I think we're talking about a lot, well, to use a Maoist term, a long march in a sense, yeah, a long development of, of, of social ecosystem construction. Wow, from Gramsci to, 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 to Mao, bypassing <laughs> Marx, is that right, Ken? No. <laughs> uh, you don't have to answer that. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> I've got... Um, a comment from Eureta, and I think it's in relation to Sylvia's question, which is that we do have a lot of an abundance of space, but much of it is already deeply degraded. A lot of work and livelihood opportunities are hidden in regenerating and rehabilitating um, such degenerated areas, which is also where very many people live. So I think that's a that's a really interesting point. We've also got a comment which is, or a question saying um, from from Sam at Jaidu asking how should developing economies, and in particular in Africa, implement the social ecosystem model because they seem to be highly attracted to developing the elite, to developing elite entrepreneurial ecosystems. So I know that's a, a very difficult question because you know, it's out of your context and it's also asking for um, kind of policy recommendations. Um, but if you have any comments or thoughts on that, and then, um, before we take the last um, comment, I'm going to um, ask you, Rita, to raise it directly because it is quite a long comment and I think it's an interesting one. So, um, Rita, can I ask you to unmute yourself? Thank you and, very uh, much, Steve. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you very much, Ken. Um, uh, what a fantastic seminar, what a fantastic concept, we've been very attracted to it uh, ever since we came across it, ever since Prisha found it for us and introduced us to it. Um, I'm from Rhodes University, as you know. Um, my comment really is picking up from what uh, Sylvia's point, and, and I, I had the thought that this is actually a nice a demonstration of the difference between the elite ecosystem concept and the social, economic, e ecological uh, ecosystem concept. Um, th that um, the traditional way to, to establish a sort of a skills hub, I would say, is, is to start it from scratch and, and to build up a new and, and attract people to it. But I, I really think that the, 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 the more um, socially oriented way, certainly um, for degraded areas and for much of South Africa would be to say, look at what is there and to work from what is there, where people are already living, where people are already eking out in existence, where industry has come and gone and left behind wastelands and unemployed people. People who are attracted by the possibility of work and then the work ends because it's not actually a sustainable form of development. I'm thinking of mining, certain forms of agriculture and so forth, industrial sort of agriculture. So I think this, um, this, this, this model, which might be a thought experiment, is fast becoming very, very much uh, visible practically. And the need for it is becoming visible practically in South Africa because you can already make policy recommendations on the basis of the regeneration of trashed land. As I put the, the chat that I put in, in a comment that I put in the chat is from the 2018 presidential jobs summit, 
which made a recommendation that the mine, Department of Mining and the Department of Environment Affairs and the Department of Water Affairs, okay, three verticalities, need to come together and sort out the existing uh, uh, policy that is making provision for mining companies to pay for the regeneration of the, of the mined out areas, which would create millions of jobs. We've got 6,000 abandoned mines uh, sites in this, in this country and nobody can use that land for anything. And so the money can be, can be utilized, but only if the parties come together. And if they then work together with the, the, the mediators, the, the skills developers to actually produce the skills for the rehabilitation, which is both very high tech skills and very low tech labor 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 based skills so it's a clear example of of what is needed and sam's question is we're so attracted to to the old style elitist model of development and china keeps dangling it in front of us as well but here your thought experiment is about to take shape i think it's a very very important concept and i think also you know the the work that kate rayworth is doing around the donut uh, economy and uh, the work in Amsterdam and, and various other cities is probably also moving towards this, but they haven't made the connection with your work yet, as far as I know, and I think it would be important to make that connection. Thank you so much for your work, Ken, and thanks for the seminar. Could I just respond? Uh, Ken, sorry, sorry, Ken, before you respond, I want to chuck one last question at you, if you don't mind, yeah. and, then, um, and, then you, and then you can respond to all of them. So this one is from Hela, and she says, when I first read this work, I was quite interested in the role of TVETs, technical and vocational education and training colleges, in the social e skills ecosystem. Could Ken talk a bit about this? In other words, the role of learning centers, schools, colleges, universities, and their role in supporting skills development with attention to local economies and their expansion and development. Okay. On the question of um, degraded spaces, in, just by of a small example, a con, uh, uh, contrast, a comparative example, is Barking and Dagenham. It previously had the Ford Works, um, uh, Ford, Motor Com Ford Motor Works and Docks, all abandoned. Um, and the question was whether in fact, it was simply going to in fact, become covered in Amazon warehouses. I mean, this is the issue that we were, were facing. That's a, a real possibility. On the one hand, you get the supernova with social displacement, and then you have the cheaper land, and then you just have the market occupy that land, yes, in a way which would produce low level insecure jobs. And here, I think this idea of rather than have what you call place exploitation, but rather having what I've termed place shaping or reshaping through a, a, a collective mission and vision of the area. That's going to be very, very important. So I totally identify with the idea that social ecosystems are not just based on the most attractive and healthy sites. Social ecosystems have to work with hard to grow terrains, if you want to go back to the natural ecological, as it were, metaphor. So I do identify with that. But then the question would be, what do collectively people want to happen to these areas? And do we have, a, how do we have models and ways of thinking? Uh, mine's, not, mine's just one way of thinking. There'll be other, the other, the other modes of thinking which I draw on, which is inclusive social economic development. We have lots of uh, uh, literature and thinking about that in, in the UK. But I do think it is about the idea of having ways of thinking of what we already what already exists and how that is reshaped, and that needs theorization, it needs philosophies, and it needs to be, as it were, uh, applied through an alliance of social forces which are both horizontal and vertical. And I come back to the forty-five degree politics that are going to be required for transformations on that kind of scale. Um, on the question of uh, tech, vocational technical institutions, I mean, given my specialisations, it's ironic I haven't really talked about them today. 
But um, when I was in Scotland, and Scotland's very interesting because it's obviously different from England, um, politically and culturally, um, we were talking about colleges, FE colleges in particular, as civic anchor institutions. Um, I also have done work in Belfast, uh, coming out of that civil war and, and, and the peace process about uh, using a, a whole set of dis developments in East Belfast, which in fact, in, in between both Catholic and Protestant communities on, on place shaping. So it, I, I think that law, you know, representative and inclusive uh, educational and technical institutions play an incredibly important role. So I, my point here is not to just depend on research intensive universities. They are part of the alliance. But if you want to develop skills at different levels, that in, not just the high, you know, if you look at the green economy, you'll see skill development often at level four and above. But we have to be, we have to also bring into the equation uh, foundation level skills that are going to be needed in the kind of regeneration the, it what what we call in, in, you know inclusive inclu beyond regeneration to inclusive growth that you are thinking about in the South African context. I'm intrigued, by the way, on how a social ecosystem model could contribute to thinking to overcoming post-apartheid legacies, spatial legacies. Really interesting concept. Great, thank you so much, Ken. Um, I think we've still got the bulk of the um, participants with us. I think it's been a really, really interesting seminar. And I think um, you can see, Ken, that it's sparked interest on a whole range of different aspects of your work. Um, I think it's been really engaging and, and really useful and has left us all with um, an enormous number of different concepts and ideas to think about and utilize as we move forward. Um, so unless anyone else has a last burning point or unless, Ken, you would like to um, say something, make a few last comments in closing, then I think we can we can move to start wrapping up. But but um, over to you, Ken, if you've got anything that you'd like to add. Well, this this is work in progress. I, I, I've now fully retired from UCL, although I'm as busy as ever. Um, I would like to. I can only do so much by myself, right? And um, I'm, I'm working with Compass and others, but I'd like, I'd like this, I'd like to form further intellectual partnerships. I have one with Beijing, uh, as you know, but I'm interested in working with you uh, to develop these ideas because these ideas won't develop just in a vacuum. They develop when they are applied to, you know, concrete settings in which we are seeking transformations. And therefore, you know, I, I would hand, uh, reach out with the hand of collaboration to anybody who wants to work with me and to co-author, uh, 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 you know, democratically to develop these ideas further, because I, I do believe that human uh, social ecological thinking has to, be one, has to be one of the great keys uh, to a sustainable, fairer future. I think that's that's a great note to end, Ken, because I think that you will see that there's a lot of interest at the real center um, in developing these ideas and also from our colleagues at Rhodes, who we work very closely with. Um, and so I think that uh, there would be an enormous amount of interest in, in taking this and moving forward with you in developing these ideas and um, and thinking about how to um, put them into practice and continue theorizing them. So I think that that's a really wonderful note on which to end. Um, and I'd just like to once again, really very warmly thank you, Ken, for giving us your time today, sharing your ideas so generously and with so much energy and enthusiasm. I think that um, it's really been a, a fantastic session. Um, Prisha, I don't know if you uh, need to say anything in closing. I think that's probably a no. Yeah. So I just yeah. like to ah, here's yes, Prisha. Sorry, I sometimes forget how these things work. So just to say again, thanks, Ken. It, you've been extremely generous. I know I reached out to you as a stranger, finding your work uh, you very useful for some of the work that we're doing at Real, together with colleagues from uh, 
Plum Roads and, and Nottingham and, and Gulu University in Uganda. So we're hoping that we can share some of the writing that we're doing in that project with you very soon and get some perspectives from, from you to help us to develop some of this work. But the point that I wanted to make, Steph, is that to just say thank you to everybody again, but just to remind them to please join us on the 26th of May for the next uh, seminar. And uh, the speaker will be none other than Professor Stephanie Alays. And uh, Stephanie uh, will, will be presenting her seminar on, um, and in her seminar, she'll be making the argument around supply and demand and arguing that supply and demand is an unhelpful notion for thinking about skills development. Uh, drawing from the reflections that she's been busy with developing South Africa's skills strategy, uh, post, the post-COVID uh, skills recovery strategy for government. So reflecting on some of the work that they have been busy with, Steph will be doing uh, the presentation on the 26th of May, and we look forward to all of you joining us for that presentation and for the rest that will be coming up thereafter. And just to repeat, the events are on our website and you'll find the recordings on the YouTube links. Thanks guys. And thanks. Okay. Thanks everyone. And you, you will also all get an emailed invitation to that and the, the upcoming seminars, including one that is going to report on the research that Preacher has been talking about on um, rethinking vocational education for Africa, working with colleagues in Nottingham and Uganda. So thank you so much, everyone. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening for those of you whom it is evening. If there's colleagues in North America, I hope you have a lovely day. And thanks again, Ken, for a really great seminar. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, Ken. Yes. Bye, everyone.